so we can. All right, Susan, we are live. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to 1455's author series and tonight's full-on celebration of National Poetry Month. Uh, of course, every month is National Poetry Month, but some months are not equal to others uh, in the public consciousness. I'm Sean Murphy. I'm the executive director of 1455. Um, if this is your first time checking us out, welcome. I'm really glad you're here. Uh, very simply and briefly, 1455 is a nonprofit. We're named after the year Gutenberg's printing press began putting out product, which democratized content in ways that continue today. And all we do is celebrate storytelling. We have free events throughout the year. And I encourage you to check us out at 1455litarts.org. And before I introduce tonight's special guest, Susan Rich, I'm happy as always that we partner with our good friends at Washington, D.C.'s historic Potter's House. They are a nonprofit cafe, bookstore, and event space in the Adams Morgan neighborhood of D.C. And since they opened their doors in 1960, they've been a key place for deeper conversation, creative expression, and community transformation. We do live events there. In fact, we have one coming up in June. But I encourage you to support them. Buy your books tonight from their bookstore. You can find links uh, on the 1455 site with all that good stuff um, and support your independent booksellers. Now, without further ado, let me welcome and introduce tonight's author with the best backdrop I've seen in quite some time. So we're already up to a great start. I am delighted. I know Susan, but this is our first chance to really take a deep dive and talk. So I've been, I've been really looking forward to this. You're going to love her. And let me explain why. Susan is the author of seven books, including Gallery of Postcards and Maps, as well as Cloud Pharmacy, The Alchemist's Kitchen, and others. Her poetry has earned awards from the Fulbright Foundation, Penn USA, The Times Literary Supplement, and others. She's the co-editor, along with Carrie Russell Agadon, of Demystifying the Manuscript, Creating a Book of Poems, Susan teaches at Highline College and directs Poets on the Coast, a writing retreat for women in Washington State. Susan, thank you for being here and thank you for making sure that we properly celebrated National Poetry Month. <laughs> well, thank you. Happy National Poetry Month to you, Sean, and to everybody listening. It's a total pleasure to be here. And I love that we're kind of coast to coast. I love that I've been to Adams Morgan and want to go back and do an event live someday now that we're back in the world of not only Zoom, but also um, events that happen in real life. They seem to have more excitement to them than I remember from the past. I don't grumble about the traffic or how long it took to find a parking spot. I'm just thrilled when that happens. But I wouldn't know you if it wasn't for Zoom. Um, we met during the pandemic at a reading, an anthology that I was in. So right. it's it's kind of nice to be at hopefully the other side of that. Absolutely. And in fact, that's a that tees up I, I have so many things, I've got so many questions, but one of the things, and I was telling you before we came on, um, your, your collection, um, Gallery of Postcards and Maps, it not only features a, a nice uh, portion of new poems or newer poems, but really is, uh, you know, collects poems from throughout your career. So to say that I've been taking a deep dive, you know, into your um, decades of, of published work is an understatement, but one of the things, of course, that, that the newer poems touch on is the pandemic. And we'll we'll get back to that because I've got some questions about kind of how we write about events and, and what it looks like to read them with distance uh, in the remove. But let me let me tee up. Well, let's jump into the collection. I mean, it's poetry month, so let's get it on. Um, Terrence Hayes, the author of American Sonnets for My Past and Future Assassin, has a beautiful um blurb which i'll read in part it says with a warmth that deepens into wisdom rich finds music in everything inside and outside her windows the book displays the hallmarks of her over her mastery of form her acuity of heart and eye these terrific poems are full of compassion lyricism and attention and reflect an ever-present restlessness of spirit flesh and intellect I not only agree with that assessment, but I couldn't have written that better. And I really think that nails. Um, so I thank Terrence for doing my work for me because I couldn't have 
more better introduced uh, what you're getting on. So first off, Susan, congratulations on this book, everyone. There's going to be, there are links. I will continue to post links so you can get a copy of this. Um, talk a bit about, um, well, I'll just, I will tee it up. In addition to Terrence, I'll say, this is obviously a book written by a woman and it's going to resonate in so many ways with women, but almost because of that, boy, should men read this work uh, for any number of reasons so they can better understand a lot of things about the world. Tell us your, you know, when you came to put this together, obviously you had new poems to collect, but talk about the decision to include some, some old, older poems too. Wow, well, thank you. And I have to say, Terrence is incredibly generous in that um, comment. So I thank him too. It was an odd thing. I mean, this book, the story behind it is that I was having um, coffee, or in his case, tea with Ilya Kaminsky, who I've known since he was in his 20s. So as a very young man, mm. and he often, um, he often will tell me things I should do. And it's kind of funny, because I'm a good deal older than he is, but he's very bossy in the best way. Right. He was saying, Susan, this is what you should do. You should do a book of your um, new and selected and you should have it done outside the country. And I'm not quite sure why he thought I should do this, but he's always given good advice. So it felt, um, well, the Yiddish word is chutzpah. Yeah. And I'm sure there's another word that I'm trying to think of. It felt a little bit um, above my pay grade, I'll say, to put together a new and selected. I don't think I would have done it if I hadn't gotten this bossy directive from Ilya. And so once I got that, it seemed kind of like an interesting idea. But when he said, oh, you should just go publish it in some other country, I thought, well, I'm not Ilya. I don't have like five countries that know my work. But Ireland is a place that I've been to several times, um, seven or eight times. I've read there before. And I had a friend, this is sort of a long answer to your question, but I I think it it is yeah. interesting and yeah. in, in illustrative that we don't know how books are gonna happen. We we often don't expect it. I still feel a little bit um a little bit shy that I have a new and selected and I'm not 90 years old. Really, I'm not. Anyway, so I had a friend who was going to Ireland. She had um Sandy Yaon, people might know her from Cultivated Voices. She'd just been published by Salmon Poetry. And she kind of said, Susan, do you have anything I should show to the editor? And I thought that was pretty funny because she didn't know the editor that well. And I don't think she's a scout for the editor, but she wanted to do that. So I said, well, I have this book called Blue Atlas. I'm trying to shop around or I could do a new and selected because Ilya had just said that. And Sandy said, oh, you should definitely do a new and selected. So over the course of a weekend, um, uh, Memorial Day weekend, I put together a new and selected and she because she was getting on an airplane and she needed it kind of like immediately. And although there are many books about how to write good poems and there's even a couple, only a couple of books on how to do a poetry manuscript. Yeah. As far as I know, there's no books and there's no essays on how to do a new and selected. It's kind of its own strange beast. Uh -huh. So I thought, okay, who's done a new and selected that I admire, whose work I like? And I reached out to Mark Doty. There's something about the internet we were talking earlier that makes me braver than I am in real life. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, I don't really know Mark Doty. Maybe I've met him once at that point. And I'm, I'm just going to ask because his new and selected, I think it won the National Book Award or, or one of the larger mm -hmm. book critics prize. Anyway, so what he said, he said many things, but one thing he said right away was, you know, know that no matter what you put together, you're going to end up leaving out poems that you really wish were in there, and you're going to put in poems that you're not sure why you did. And, you know, I don't know if that made me feel better, but I sort of did, because if Mark Doty says you can't kind of get it 100% right, that was kind of freedom. And he said, even your friends, they'll just tell you, oh, I read this poem to my lover under a tree on our first date, and that's why you should include it. That's probably not a really good reason to include it. <laughs> so I used Mark Doty's um, New and Selected as kind of a model for me. And also Salmon Poetry in, in Ireland has a number of New and Selected. And so in terms of, gosh, am I really not going to remember this? I think it ends with the earlier work. 
So you get the new work and yes. then you get Cloud Pharmacy, Alchemist yeah. Kitchen, and you kind of are traveling all the way back in time to the first book, Cartographer's Tongue. So, you know, because like I said, there's not a how-to kit on how to do it. It's its own kind of weird beast. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, and so, you know, for, for the reader, the, we have the advantage of really getting the full Susan Rich experience. And certainly, as we alluded to earlier, you are writing about uh, real time, real world events. Um, and, 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 I, and I really enjoyed kind of getting new because we, of course, we see things like 9-11 with fresh eyes. I think we're beginning to see right now that it's been a couple few years, I'm seeing more and more pandemic poems and I think the early narrative is beginning to form uh, um, in terms of how we kind of articulate what we experience. And of course, the artists always get there first. Um, so, we, but I, I'm I'm sensing that that's already happening, and and your your poems are contributing to that body of work. But I I kind of made a list, and this is a very short list of kind of recurring themes, and there is a lot of fur, wings water, blood, longing, and remembrance. I'm curious if you would say, are there some, are there certain themes and through lines and touchstones that you would say, like someone being introduced to my work that hasn't read this book yet, what are some of Susan's obsessions and, and, you know, recurring themes? Hmm. Wow. I would never put blood on that list. I'm not very good with blood. So it's kind of funny that that's there. Um, the color blue shows up a lot. And so finally, in the next book that's coming out next year, it's called Blue Atlas. I'm finally owning the word and the multiple ways that one can understand that word. Yeah. So that's certainly something. Um, I don't know if this is kind of a theme in one word, but inquisitiveness, yeah. questions, often asking questions. I have a, I have a poem coming out um, in tab journal and in the next book, which is just a litany of questions as a poem and kind of the Neruda book of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. poem. And then there's this kind of mix between maybe social justice issues, particularly I worked for Amnesty International for five years and I worked in Bosnia and West Africa. So that's there for quite a while. And then when I ended up staying home more and being in Seattle, which is what I now call home, I got very interested in surrealist painters. And I think it was sort of like they allowed my imagination to travel, even if physically I was now more grounded in one place. So the last, I think, three books have um, unknown photographers and then this book, Gallery of Postcards and Maps, you can see from um, the cover that you showed up yeah. is Remedios Varo, who's getting a lot of attention right now, very deservedly so. There's going to be a giant show of her work in Chicago this summer. And I'm thinking, I got to get myself to Chicago. You need to do a reading at that at that showing, right? Well, that would be cool. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, one of the reasons that travel wasn't a word on my on the list I just mentioned because my next question goes there. Um, there were inevitably looking at, at 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 thinking about Amnesty International and your travels and where you traveled in particular. I was inevitably reminded a bit of Carolyn Forche, um, you know, her poignant poetry of witness and that whole kind of sensibility of of, of not forgetting places we go of oft forgotten or not talked about people. But you know what I also thought of? Uh, I, 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 I was rumbling around in my mind and I thought, I gotta look this up. There's a great Mark Twain quote that I think most people have heard, but it's travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry and narrow-mindedness. So I think it's an unassailable observation, but gosh, I think this applies to your work. Um, and I think it also speaks as an antidote to our contemporary climate where so many folks are siloed, uh, you know, I think we we were wrong to imagine that the internet was going to open up all these possibilities, which in some ways, of course, it did. But we've now been able to kind of curate our own existences, where we receive news from trusted sources and we interact with people, and and there is this kind of enclosing phenomenon. Your poetry, I just said the word antidote, but I think it, I'll repeat it, is an antidote to that kind of insular thinking. And in so many ways, both the literal travel and this inquisitive, uh, very empathetic questing um, were, were often 
in other places. Well, that seems like a pretty good place for me to read some poems of a different place, if that sounds. Ah, uh, please do. Yes. Yay. So these are some, um, a few of the older poems about my time in Bosnia, Herzegovina. And I was there at the end of the Bosnian war for the first ever Bosnian elections. And I was working on the elections, which was kind of crazy but they were looking for bodies who would go to a country where war you know, had just happened and might still be happening. And as a former Peace Corps volunteer, um, we got called up to that if we wanted to do it. And at the time I was working for Amnesty and the Bosnian situation was super complex because depending where in the country you lived, who was kind of warring with whom would be different. So I felt obliged to go because it was the only way I was going to understand anything of what was happening there. Yeah, so yeah. here are just a couple of poems, I guess I'll read. Um, the first one's called Oslo Bojena, and that was the daily newspaper in Sarajevo at the time. And this is actually the only found poem I've ever written, which means I basically stole things from an interview with the editor of the paper at that time. So. Yeah, that's all you need to know, I think. Oslo Bojena. The first year of the siege, we changed sizes 13 times. No one expected to see a paper come out of those flames. Yes, we had losses. The local correspondent in Zvornik our finance clerk traveling between offices, yet on that last bus out of the city, no one wanted to leave. The paper migrated from yellow to blue to green. There was just bread and paper, and there were many days without bread. I tried to find him to sort of like, pay homage and I have his name in the back, but he was impossible to find. Um, and a lot of my poems you'll see here are written about people that I met. And that started when I was in West Africa. It's like, how could I, a you know, Jewish girl from Boston write about this other place? And I felt like I can do it if I'm honoring people that I meet along the way, I'm not you know, creating. So I'll read this other one and then we'll see. Um, this is called Guzzle for the woman from Vitez. And you probably know that a guzzle is done so that it's in couplets, long line couplets, and the end of each couplet ends with the same word. And here it will be really easy to catch because the word is word. <laughs> guzzle for the woman from Vitez, Vitez, Bosnia. It's the best watermelon in the world, but there's no way to say it in words. She had squatted in the space for apples and pears under the staircase one year beyond the place of words. Now she comes back with tea, examines me closely, my out of date phrase book, my mispronounced words. I ask for the toilet and she shows me the bedroom bombed by neighbors who should have known how to use words. We walk out to her garden in late afternoon light, survey squash plants and corn stalks. We re-enter words. In Bosnian, the tomato is called paradise, sweetness transferred from some other country's words. We drink rounds of whiskey, call her son on the phone, laughing because we have found a way out through words. Wow. Thank you for sharing both of those, Susan. And, you know, every time I hear a poet read her work, it is just a, such a powerful reminder that, that those moments right are what art does is it ensure that moment now is immortal you've immortalized it no one that was involved in that exchange is forgotten um 
and it's indelibly remembered with beautiful language. I I just, there's nothing better than that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I also think you're being a little bit modest. If I, I, I can help and maybe entice a few more. I have a couple of requests. If you do, you, do you take requests in National Poetry Month? Um, I I would be happy to. Yes. So uh, I mean, there's I mean, and I always I always do the um, the dog ear test. You can always tell when I've enjoyed a book when you <laughs> see a lot of dog ears. But I did I did make a couple a special note of uh, Haiti, which I described in my notes as just devastating, a compressed masterpiece of empathy and observation. I would be delighted if you'd read that for us. I would. Um, so that's from my first book, Cartographer's Tongue. I guess the good thing about a newest selected is you can buy one book and get, you know, the hits. And it's the, ga- he- it's the gateway drug to the poet. <laughs> I like that. The gateway drug to the poet. So I don't need to tell too much about this, except that this was, yeah, I'll talk afterwards. Sometimes okay. people like set poems up. I don't think there's anything here that's going to be too difficult to understand. And I'll kind of explain where the poem came from after. So the poem is called Haiti. It's 4 a.m. on her birthday as she prepares for morning mass, wanting the luck early prayers are said to bring. Today, she's turning 16 and the only one awake. She brushes her hair back, drawing it into a braid, puts in the silver earrings, tiny as insect eyes, and turns to admire the curve of her legs in silk stockings. She spies her brother's jacket, lifts it from the hook, singing under her breath. The day is fine. The breeze feels cool along the edge of her skin. She walks out onto the porch. A shadow blocks her way down the stairs, a body propped against bougainvillea, rigid against clay pots. Here is a gift from the Tantan Makut. Someone's brought Papa home. A note pinned to his collar, like a caption she writes for her scrapbook. The face is swollen, the soles of the feet burnt, the lips one long purple bruise. This family has 24 hours to leave. There are no words to remember, no beginning or end to this day. Her mother puts them on a boat, nodding goodbye from the dock. I will join you. The girl wonders when they became flecks of glass, bits of color thrown out to sea. She listens to the priest bless their voyage, wondering at the words, asylum seekers. Doesn't know she is one of 10,000 faces that those like her are not believed are sent home, followed, and will leave again. She watches her mother turn into the horizon. So this poem is dedicated to someone I worked with at Amnesty. Um, Her name was Eve Rose, and she was, um, we had, and maybe Amnesty still does, a kind of internship program, a fellowship program, And Eve Rose and I would go out and talk to high schools to try to get students interested in starting an amnesty group or learning more about human rights. And only one day of all the times we went out and did this, this was like a weekly thing, did she kind of tell what had happened to her family? And the poem tells you that as well, I believe. But it wasn't something she talked about much, even though we were quite close. So time went by, she went on and got another job in the area, and somehow this poem um, happened to me, happened through me a year or more after she told me the story. I'm not a quick writer. And then all of a sudden, there was a journal that wanted to publish it, and I had this issue of, Eve Rose doesn't even know the poem exists. I can't, like, publish this without her 
mm. permission. I mean, obviously one could, it's not illegal, right. but I felt very strongly that this was her personal story. So I called her up on a weekday. Her office was down the street from mine. I'm like, Eve Rose, I have some news to tell you. Um, do you have some time? And she said, good news or bad news? I was like, well, <laughs> I'm hoping you think it's good news. And, and I just remember her saying, oh, I'll come right by. You know, even though we're on the phone, she'll, I'll come right by, which was kind of, you know, wonderful, right? In the middle of a yeah. work day. Yeah. So she came and I, and I read it to her and I told her, you know, somebody wanted to publish it, but it was totally up to her whether that happened or not. And, you know, thankfully she, she was okay with it. And she was quite taken. She said no one in her family had ever written down what happened to them. So this was, as you just said earlier, Sean, documenting um, a particular time in her life that had not been written. So um, I, I like that this poem had another life beyond a poem um, that I wrote for a magazine or a book. Well, and so, I mean, Susan, thank you for that. That's extraordinary. And I, I have to say, I'm, I'm, you know, verklempt. Uh, yes, we're, it's National Poetry Month and we are literally talking about poetry. Okay, great. But what you just did is you just articulated what is poetry really? Why does it matter? How is it done? What is the responsibility of the artist? It's all in there. Um, and, and, and it's so, you know, again, we, we were talking before we came on live about you know, the inevitable, like if, if you're going to be a poet, you're most people, you know, your hopes and expectations are, are grounded. Um, but the real reason I think poets are drawn to that particular form is there are certain things only poems can do, uh, and, and a way of communicating and connecting in such a short time that reverberates with the reader after. And, and I know I'm going to think of those last lines of that poem. Those are never going to leave me. Um, and and it's so special that you were able to talk to her and and that she blessed uh, the publication of that poem. She told me what I got wrong. She's like, Susan, silk stockings? What are you talking about? But um, it yeah. was okay with her that that stayed, but that was one of the things, you know, that her family would not have been, she would not have been wearing silk stockings, but it sounded good in that particular moment. That's right. So. Well, and that, and that gets into the whole, right? Especially as a teacher, which we will get into in a little bit about the art of teaching. Um, you know, we, we, we explain as art, as creators and, and teachers, um, you know, there's the authorial license and there's the no notion of language and words. And sometimes truth has to take a little bit of a backseat because if you want the truth, it's not a poem, it's the, the truth. And that's not very poetic. Um, I don't think that that's unduly heavy. I think it's a necessary poem on any occasion, but if I could request another one that is, is a little bit more, well, light, but um, it, first of all, it, it, you had me at the title, which is Vegetarian Vampires Walk Into a Bar. And, and that should have been on my list. I don't think I mentioned food, but food, the preparation of it, the, the creation of it. And that certainly made me think, I, 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 I talked about Carolyn Forche and Mark Twain. I thought about Anthony Bourdain a lot, uh, specifically the way he so wonderfully articulated that it's food that brings cultures together. It's the, 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 the eating and the preparation and cleaning of food that allows people from different backgrounds to remember what unites us all. Well, thank you. Um, yes, so Remedios Varo, same artist that we just talked about who's on the cover. There's about four or five poems in here directly from her painting. So she has a painting called Vegetarian Vampires. And I would encourage everybody to look it up online. It is quite funny. And I think I spent years not writing because it's like, you already have a really funny painting. What can one do with it? So I'll, I'll read the poem and I'll say, I don't know if there's much to say about it. And then I'm gonna throw one poem in that I, that I have wanted to read. So, okay. um, so this is Vegetarian Vampires Walk Into a Bar After Remedios Varo, whose show is in Chicago this summer. Okay, but I can't, now I have to start over because the, the title leads into the first line of the poem. Yep. Vegetarian vampires walk into a bar, insert straws into fruits and flowers, drink the lifeblood of a watermelon, a tomato, a five-petaled rose. Their faces appear as expressionless as businessmen, 
about to go under. Their new suits woven from subsidized chaffs of wheat, already frayed at the knees. From underneath twin bowler hats flash enormous golden air wings. Perhaps they're listening to a botanist's lament for the dying or the rap of lemon thyme. Perhaps we've arrived too late to save the world's gardens. Still, we will stage protests in alliance with the waves of grain. Underneath the vampire's bar stools, two pet roosters snore, their combs and wattles luminous, their speckled collars hand carved from the finest melon skins. So I, I don't really think of myself as an eco poet or you know eco activist, but I think this poem might do a little bit of that. Indeed, indeed. So the poem I was going to read, and um, you brought Terence Hayes up earlier, and he is a kind of um, poetry mentor for me. I feel like he gives me permission to do a lot of different things. I'm always fascinated by where his mind is going to go and by him being, I think, so free in his work, it encourages us as well. Yeah. So um, I'm assuming that people who are listening might be poets. And this poem, Extreme Close Up, it came from a prompt that a friend of mine, Elizabeth Austin, gave me. We would get together and, and, and write for an afternoon and see what would happen. It was like we were going fishing after we sort of set the timer for 18 or 20 minutes would be, did you catch anything? Did you get anything? So she gave me the assignment of one of um, Terence Hayes's poems, American Sonnets for My Past and Future Assassin. You know that book, you know they all have the same title. But one of them is about the face of James Baldwin and the seven or so things that Terence Hayes likes about that face. So the assignment that Elizabeth gave me was, can you write a sonnet focused on a face? And you know that means you can't go to the shoulders or the feet or the hips, you really have to stay on that face. And this is the poem that came and it's, um, yeah, I'll read you the poem and then I'll tell you the story. There's two words that you might want to know. Um, a kanish is Jewish um, delicacy, I suppose, or maybe not. It's really peasant food, let's be honest. Mm -hmm. And it's essentially pastry filled with meat. And if you've ever heard of a Cornish pasty, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, so many different cultures have some version of meat contained in some kind of floury thing. So that's in here. And then I like poems that teach me something. I like like, oh, you get this extra benefit. So I don't know if you can see it, but the philtrum, the little indentation you have, everybody has underneath yep. their nose, that's the philtrum. Here goes the poem. Extreme close up. All the things I love about his face come from movement. The fishtail lines sketched just above the edges of his cheekbones a tadpole of a mustache, which appears, then disappears, inked along the philtrum, trimmed to obscure the future. And yes, my father's ears do resemble oyster shells, sculptures adorned with an outcropping of hair. Praise be to his widow's peak, unfurrowed, and furrowed like a sail for survival to his small mouth, now open, ready for a lobster tail or a knish. And somewhere, perhaps burnishing his jaw or dimpled chin, his father's early death and the knowledge of his own. I scan the code in his crescent-shaped eyes my eyes, DNA spiraling along a connected shoreline, the taking and giving back of deep waters, his wonderment hooked to sorrow. So, wow. My dad 
passed away in 95, so it's been a while, but he is certainly, when you asked me earlier, this is what I should have said, um, the theme of writing about my dad. There's poems in almost every book. And so this is from the New and Selected. And I really thank, I thank my friend Elizabeth Austin, poet Elizabeth Austin, but I also thank Terrence for that poem. Mm -hmm. And I had kind of a once in a lifetime experience of getting to read with Terrence Hayes and Jane Hirschfield on the stage of the Skagit Poetry Festival. And it was a very like out of body experience because I was sort of terrified to be reading with these two poetry heroes. Yeah. But somehow I got myself to read this poem. So um, for better or worse, Terrence has heard this poem as well. <laughs> well, uh, based on his blurb, I think he endorses. So <laughs> I think we're good. I think we're good there. Um, so I actually, of course, have a bunch of other questions, but I don't want to sleep on we've, we've you know, National Poetry Month and we've, we're packets of one, two punch, but demystifying the manuscript. I mean, look, we, here's my blurb for this. Anybody at any level of experience could do well from reading this because there's so much uh, knowledge dropped from so many different people. Um, and, and the industry is always changing, you know, certain things remain the same. So first of all, a very useful book, but it's a very generous book. And I think one of the things that's so powerful about this is it's attempting to do what you alluded to earlier. There's not a lot of kind of guidebooks on the nitty gritty. We get really wrapped up and I think it's very sexy to write or think about the craft and we, ha we, we have to have those books, but a real guide that breaks it down um, where someone can learn from others experience. I think the world thanks you for this. Talk about how this came together. Oh, thank you. Um, so Kelly Russell Agadon, who is the my co-editor, she and I are dear friends from way back. In fact, we started Poets on the Coast together. And Poets on the Coast used to be about a six hour ride from where we live. So we would have these giant car trips and I kind of missed those, right? We moved it closer, which was probably a smart move. But <laughs> Kelly and I were coming back from Poets on the Coast one year after a, you know, a three or four day workshop. And it was 2000, probably early 2014. We both had books coming out that year. We had done a lot of work to try to figure out, you know, cover art and how to order it. And, you know, in that kind of hubris, that's the word I was looking for before, like, oh, we could write a book about this. We should write this book. And it started on that car trip. And I think the first line of the intro somewhere is, um, you know, what, be, what you have, am I going to find it? Yes, really, it is. Spread out before you across. No, that is not it. Here it is. The very first thing in the introduction that Kelly and I wrote, the book you hold in your hand is a vessel. And that came from that that car trip that was like okay we have the first line now we can write a book yeah, right yeah <laughs> what we ended up doing was like you know we're poets writing a whole prose book seemed really long and we're like you know we're just two people maybe we should get everyone we know and invite everyone we know and people we don't know we put out a call um i think on wumpo years ago saying you know do you want to write an essay for this book and so lots of people did want to write essays for this book. So that was one of the ways we got people. And then our lives got busy and we got busy with our own work and things went on and the industry changed. Everything changed. And we thought, you know, I don't know how useful. We were modeling in the early days. There's a book I'm going to, apologies for not remembering the name of the editor, but the book is called Ordering the Storm. And it's a collection of about a dozen essays widely varied in what they say about putting a book together. And that's what, you know, everyone I knew read and held on to, even though it was kind of outdated, even though it wasn't helpful with the nitty gritty, Absolutely. but it was all that was out there. So we decided we needed to expand that concept. We didn't want to just kind of write scholarly essays. We wanted to have interviews with editors, right? So there's an interview with Jeff Schatz from Grey Wolf, and there's an interview with Dennis Maloney from White Pine. What are they looking for? What do they want? And then is it only um, the ordering of the poems, or is it also like my favorite thing to think about is artwork, as you can tell from my background, which is a Leonora Carrington print. 
So we decided to do like a whole part on kind of a checklist of things you can do when you're starting to collect artwork. Having a Pinterest account so that you can have everything in one place is super easy, free, and helpful. Yep. So it kind of evolved. And then we decided we wanted um, we wanted writers that were well known. Linda Paston was one of the first people that we um, reached out to. And I think I'm going to read a little bit of her essay. But then we have people whose first book was just coming out. So we wanted it to kind of include everyone. And it's kind of a joke between Kelly and, and I that like we're working on books right now. It's like, we better reread this book and see what people said. Like, we need this book. We wrote the book that we needed, or we we didn't write it. We cajoled our friends into um, contributing to the book that we needed. So it has, I hope, something in there for everyone. And I agree, Sean, it's not just for someone who's starting out where I think it's kind of their new best friend, but for someone who's on their sixth or seventh book to try to do something different. That's right. And uh, you, you might have noticed I smiled. So my next question was actually, I know uh, you uh, you wanted to call attention to the essay by Linda Paston, and perhaps you could read a little bit from that. Thank you. Um, Linda Paston, I saw read when I was a sophomore in high school. And I thought, oh, that doesn't look so hard. I can do that in that way that like bratty teenagers think. And right. then she was my... Um, teacher at Breadloaf when I went many years ago and then we stayed in touch and she was very important and I'll say this only because I need to remember as a teacher as a professor how much one sentence that you say to somebody can matter and so she worked with me and we're saying goodbye at the end of the two weeks of Breadloaf and she comes and she gives me a hug and Linda wasn't particularly a huggy person but so that was already a surprise and then, she, but people are saying goodbye and it's that nostalgia. And then she says to me, keep in touch. I want to follow your career. And I looked over my shoulder to see who she was talking to because I didn't have a career. I hadn't gone to grad school. I'd published a poem or two, but her belief in me, and who knows if she remembered that she'd said that was so instrumental to have somebody say that. So um, she was the first person that we asked to be in this collection and in total Linda form two weeks later came a perfect essay there was not a comma out of place there was nothing we needed to change so I'll read you a little from the beginning of it and a little bit from the end um, Linda passed and passed away just a couple of months ago in January and it, it still saddens me that she's not um, she's not here with us and that she wasn't here to to get a copy of this but she she knew it was coming her essay is called More Than the Sum of Its Parts on Putting Together a Book. From almost the beginning of my writing life, whenever I finished a poem, I was always sure it would be the last poem I would ever write. In the same way, I still think every book I publish will be my last. When I recently handed in my 14th manuscript, for example, I thought to name it Final Poems, or at least penultimate poems. When I mentioned these titles to my husband, he just laughed. So I'm calling it insomnia instead. Let's start then with titles. I do think they're important, the portal to what is to come. And they're usually easier for a poet to find than for a novelist. If a book contains 50 or 60 poems, one of those poems can usually be counted on to become a good title poem. My creative energies have waned with age, though I try to make the best use I can of whatever energy is left. But what I described above, what I think of as a fear of writer's block rather than writer's block itself has little to do with me being in my eighties, nor has the way I put together a book changed much. Actually, I never think about the book when I'm writing, only about the poem I happen to be working on at the moment. I don't try to keep writing on related subjects, for instance, or to identify and follow themes that might unify a coming book, though certainly they may exist. I wait until I have a hundred or so individual poems finished, and this usually takes four or five years. Then moving furniture about as needed, I spread them out on the study floor and gaze at them. So much paper, so many trees. 
Should I read a little bit from the end? Absolutely. Um, perhaps I care too much about how my books look, and I do spend a lot of time searching for the perfect cover art. I don't bother much with the covers of other poets' books. I'm usually too eager to read their poems to even notice them, but I certainly care a lot about mine, and I think I may know why. When I published my first book in 1971, I thought there would be rolls of thunder that the world, my world at least, would dramatically change. But I quickly learned that when a book of poems is published, not a lot happens. A glass of champagne or two with friends to celebrate, a few scattered reviews if you're lucky. The thunder only comes at the moment of holding the finished book and feeling its small heft in your hand, of looking at its cover as if you were seeing it for the first time. That's wonderful. And, you know, that that manages to touch. I, I think that's a great encapsulation of, of, of so much of the the knowledge and, and also kind of the impetus for a book like this, you know, the real genuine desire to inform and inspire. But um, gosh, be, again, before we came on, we didn't leave it in the in the green room, which is always a concern. Um, we talked about the inevitable, I don't even want to use the word disappointment, just the reality of in a very busy world, uh, a writer has put so much time and energy and, and there's so much solitude involved. And there's like this ex expectation that the proverbial champagne cork will pop and, and everything will change. And it can be very disenchanting when very little changes. Um, but you have to live in that in that understanding that it's all about the poem. It's all about the poetry. It's about the process. Um, that certainly comes through in your work, Susan. You know, and I think bookending with these with these is a great way to kind of talk about you and, and your whole sensibility. You're a teacher. You're a writer. But you are not satisfied with that. You you had to write and curate this book, um, and in this theme of connection, which we talk about a lot at 1455, community and connection, and and how that brings all these different disparate pieces together. Talk a little bit about how you view connection and community, and and the importance of that. Well, I think I was talking to one of my students today and saying that sort of this very antiquated idea that the poet should be up in their quiet room with no sound and they should be holding their head like this and <laughs> you know, aching for the you know one beautiful poem they're going to write is just not true and I don't know if it ever was but it certainly has nothing to do with how I work and that being surrounded by other people and reading other people's work and being immersed in like a poetry bath is what helps me to continue I think it's the idea that community feeds us. And I think it's taken me a lot of my life to figure that out, but certainly with poetry. So a couple of the ways that I do that is for five years, I, I um, curated a reading series in West Seattle where I live. And it was because there was no reading series at the time. And I kind of grabbed two friends because it would have been too much work and not nearly as fun to do by myself. And the three of us would, you know, get together once a month, we enjoyed each other's company, and we would have different months of the year when we would choose the two writers, it was poetry and prose. Um, two of us were poets, one of us was a fiction writer and a um, librettist also is now doing um, oh, cool. musicals. So we had, it was, it was just lovely. And we brought together, people would come every month, every month they'd come out to see what we were doing. And it was in this wonderful C&P coffee shop that we all loved. So um, it's a lot of work that was all, you know, out of the love of doing it, but it was, it was useful. And I like to say after five years, we stopped it when we still all liked each other and we still all remained friends because at some point it just became, you know, people were so sad that we were closing up shop and we're like, well, you can take it over. And they're like, oh no, no, I don't have time for that. And the other community thing that I've been doing, I think this is our 14th year, is the um, Poets on the Coast, a weekend writing retreat for women. And again, Kelly Russell Agadon and I started that. We've been partners in crime and many things. And again, it came from a conversation over a glass of wine where we were being invited to teach at local um, retreats, local events. And 
you know, once I was put in an unheated stairwell and that's where I had to teach and my students had to sit on the stairs in order to like, you know, get this class they paid for. And, you know, that's just one example of how things weren't working in an optimum sense. And so Kelly and I and our kind of hubris were like, if we ran a retreat, there would be presents for everyone and everyone would feel seen and everyone would feel included and there'd be lots of free food. And we would do one-on-one -on -one meetings with people without it being extra money to get that. And so that was where it came from. It really came from this idea of an ideal, both of these events, actually, I'm thinking about this as I say it to you, the um, Words West was the reading series we paid our writers, we sold their books, we didn't take any cut from that, and we did recordings of things that they could put up on their site. So the idea was, what's the ideal reading series that I would love to be invited to? What's the ideal retreat that I would like to go to? And kind of modeling it from there and, and trying to, I guess, model generosity and, and kindness because that's the only way one can do this in the long term. I really believe that. And plus, it's just good practice in life to be a good human. Well, well said, uh, fully agreed. And I think that that's a real, it's a, it's a great reminder. It gives me the opportunity to, to, to just say that uh, for anyone that appreciates poetry, that is half the battle, you know, buying the book and enjoying the author. I mean, there's a connection made there and, and we appreciate you doing that. But especially for fellow writers, there are usually people behind the scenes, whether it's at the independent literary magazines, the independent presses, events like this, where uh, it's a labor of love. It's a labor of love. It's a very selfish endeavor in, in many ways because it's so gratifying and it, it affords conversations like this. But there's usually are people doing a lot of work. And when you think about that, Think about buying more books. Think about supporting these nonprofits. Think about sharing the news on your on your social feeds because a little bit goes a long way. And Susan, I think I am correct in assuming you, like myself and many of the writers I associate with, are appalled by the scarcity model of writers kind of wanting to have their own little turf because if I give up what little bit I have, it takes away. And the reality is it's, it's exactly the opposite. It is. And we kind of get ideas from each other and we cheer each other on. And I mean, I've had many poetry friends that have had great acclaim and I am thrilled for them. And, you know, deservedly so. The fact that there is a profile of Maggie Smith in the New York Times today is kind of great. And she's on her second week of being on the New York bestsellers list, not for her poetry, for her memoir, but it's all connected. And years ago, before any of this happened, um, she put out a tweet that she was going to be in Seattle and what were the vegetarian restaurants. And again, in this in this kind of like bravery, I just said, I'd be happy to show you the vegetarian restaurants. You know, I'm, I'm in town and took her and her friend and we drove around. I showed her the city. And, you know, now it just feels kind of fun to be connected to someone who is so deserving of the fame they're getting. Um, there's enough for everybody. There is, but but and I think what I what I want to acknowledge and really celebrate uh, about you, Susan, is you you obviously pay it forward. And and I mean, we've in this brief conversation, we've touched on so many, uh, you know, very powerful ways that art happens, the, the travel, curiosity, empathy, and then how does it resonate? It's this notion of of connection and community and getting directly involved, rolling up one's sleeves and saying, uh, you've alluded to it twice, the, the create the book that you want to be in the world and create the literary scene that maybe doesn't exist. Because if we don't do it, it's definitely not going to happen on its own. And it's interesting. I mean, I've had the good fortune to live in South Africa for a while. And in Ireland, I, I traveled last summer. And you meet people who are doing this kind of community poetry work or community writing. And like, there's a kinship. It doesn't matter what country they come from. You immediately recognize this sense of wanting to play it forward and give to different people, especially in my teaching, having my students understand that they can be writers. You don't have to be a certain economic background or a certain color or a certain whatever 
that they have a voice and to use that voice and to kind of pursue it um, is, is really important to me, particularly with students who don't feel they have that. Yeah, yeah, that's great to hear. Um, so, you know, it's amazing how quickly an hour can go by when you're having fun, but I would be remiss if I didn't say, well, first of all, you know, I think someone wanting to discover you, this is a great place to start, but as a teacher, as a poet with, you know, decades of published experience and interaction, what is something you would want to tell an aspiring or mid-career poet about the craft? You know, what, what is your, for National Poetry Month, what is your piece of advice for uh, wannabe poets or poets wanting to write poetry? Um, poetry is play. It's many things, but it is play as in P-L-A-Y, as in throw out a word list and see if you can do a poem from the words that a friend generates for you. Take a poem and you know look at the end words of each line and see if you can meet that with something else. Make yourself uncomfortable. Write in a form that you really dislike. I can remember having that um, experience in graduate school and I hated surreal work because to me surreal work was like these guys in France sitting around smoking cigarettes and taking advantage of women. And all of a sudden, a lot of my poetry, not all of it, is surreal. And so you never know what's going to be your next inspiration. And I think, Sean, we've been talking about having been doing this since our 20s. You've got to find ways to feed yourself as a writer. And um, for most of us, I think that means finding new ways to write, finding things that, you know, my normal poem is two line couplets down the page. So what if I take the right hand side of the margin? Or what if I do things that are like a line of questions? That makes me kind of uncomfortable. It brings me out of my comfort zone. And hopefully I get some no new skills and some fun. So I think, you know, whenever I write essays, I'm like, this is hard work. How many words do I have? When will this be done? Like, I'm clearly not really an essayist by um, design. Sometimes it can be great. But poetry is just, you know, where I find joy. And I, I just did an interview for my students. And I said, I think I finally realized poetry is my religion. Mm. Mine too. Yeah. Well, it's National Poetry Month. So what better time to, to de declare our allegiance? Um, Susan, you know, every I, I'm a big fan of whatever the art form. I mean, the art has to account for itself. It has to justify itself. And that's satisfying to an extent. But the fact that we, when we have an opportunity to speak with and learn from poets and artists that are still with us, like we're doing tonight, it's such a wonderful gift. And and every, I, I feel like I had a, a really good handle on you from reading these books and, and kind of getting a sense of your sensibility and where you've been and how you've reacted to that. But everything you've said tonight reinforces um, just these fundamental precepts of what makes a great artist curiosity, empathy, a desire to challenge oneself, and, and this kind of burning indignity at injustice and unfairness and wanting to teach others. It's all in there. So you contain multitudes uh, and you express them wonderfully. Well, thank you. I, 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 I'm glad this is being recorded because I know there's going to be times where I'm like, what did Sean say about me? That sounded so good. Who is that person? I would like to meet her. So I really appreciate you doing this. I appreciate all the work you do as a community, as a citizen of the literary world. And thank you so much for reading so carefully, for articulating what I do. As you know, it's kind of hard to articulate one's own ideas, but to have someone else do it, it's like, yeah, I think that sounds that sounds good. Thank you so much for that. And um, I hope you've mentioned also that you're a poet and I've written a review of your work as well. So um, it, it's all about coming together as equals and seeing what's going on and, and, and helping each other out. So I appreciate you so much. Well, thank you for that. And and really, I mean, uh, you, you, we we try not to be trite or or use cliches, but you you made it really easy. As I said before we came on, I'm happy to repeat, uh, folks. I had a great time. I learned a lot, but I took a deep dive. I encourage you to do the same. We we did record this. It'll be posted on our site. We'll put it all over social. There's going to be links to how to get these books. Support an independent bookstore, but get them by any means necessary. National Poetry Month is not over and it's never over. Susan, we will meet again. Um, maybe we'll do something at the Potter's House. Let's make that a goal. Yes. Automatic bucket list. Um, 
I look forward to continuing this conversation. And again, I want to thank you for your work, but also I want to thank you for being a force for good in the world. It's really uh, inspiring. And tonight has been super contagious. So talk to you soon. Be well um, and, and keep up the great work. Thank you. And right back at you. Thank you so much. Potter's House, Morgan's Adams Morgan. Yay. All right, Susan, we'll talk soon. All right. Take care. And everyone, thanks for checking us out. Spread the word and we'll see you at the next conversation.